I want you to take your Bibles and uh, get ready to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20. That's where we're going to be today. I've been thinking about studying and in the, the whole ideas of, of thanks and praise and gratitude. And uh, some of you have heard of the, the author, entrepreneur, business voice, Simon Sinek. He has a class. Did you know this? He has a class on gratitude. He has a gratitude class that'll cost you $85. And this is going to be totally free today. So, and this is going to even be better. But whatever else, it's a gratitude class because he knows the value of gratitude. On their website, when they talk about the gratitude class, they talk about the fact that the brain has a biological bias, a biological bias to the negative. It sees negative, and there in, through gratitude, you start to disrupt that negative pattern, and you rewire the brain to start to see things positively. Of course, we have another thing that helps us rewire our brain, amen? The Word of God, and, but so that we don't see things negatively. But I want to talk a little about that today. I'm going to tell you a story. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you a story from Scripture. We're going to look at it. And then at the end, we're going to put what it says to, in, into practice, and we're going to be changed by the time we leave this place. Is that all right? Yes. All right, so, and, uh, and this is not the library, and, uh, and you can talk back to me, all right? You don't, have to, you don't have to say I'm saying something wrong or correct me or anything like that, but you can agree with me. Only if you agree, kind of just shout it out. And um, thank you. And, but I'm going to tell you a story from Scripture that, uh, so just, you're, you may not take a, a bunch of notes, but just, just sit back and enjoy this story. And, uh, and so we're going to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. All right? Is that all right? Yeah. Now, to set this up uh, for you Bible geeks uh, uh, or fellow Bible geeks, I want to set this up and help you understand a little Bible history. So just, just. If you don't like, if, you don't, if you're not into this, just give me a few minutes because there are people around you that really like this. All right. The story of Scripture leading up to Jesus is 2,000 years before Jesus. 2,000 years before Jesus was the character that became the father of many faiths. His name was Abraham, right? Abraham. 2,000 years before Jesus is Abraham. 500 years later, 1,500 in round numbers, 1,500 years before Jesus is the man who led Israel out of bondage in Egypt, and his name? Moses. 2,000 years before Jesus is? 500 years later, 1,500 years before Jesus is? Moses. 500 years later, about a thousand years before Jesus is the man after God's own heart, one of the great kings of Israel, and his name was David. And this started, David then had a son, and he led, Solomon, that led Israel into a civil war. And by about 930 B.C., 930 years before Jesus, Israel became a divided kingdom, right? It's the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. That's about ninth, and they were divided, friends, listen, never to be reunited again. In the, there was about 40 kings over the northern and southern kingdoms. 40 kings over both of those kingdoms. Eight of which the Bible calls good kings. And by the way, none of them were in the northern kingdom. There were no good kings in the northern kingdom. They led Israel on a secular path. We're gonna, if we, we won't maybe throw God out, but we're going we're gonna to just have God be part, one, of, one of the God, many gods that we serve. They became very cultural. They became very embedded in the culture. And they tried to do things that, you know, they wanted to worship God the way they wanted to worship God. There were no good kings in the north. And, uh, and there were eight good kings in the south. And we're going to talk about one of those kings, good kings in the south. He's the fourth king 
of the kingdom of Judah, the fourth king of Judah, which is the southern kingdom, and his name was Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. All right? So let's look at 2 Chronicles. <clears throat> Jehoshaphat took the throne at 35 years old. He reigned for 25 years, which was, and it was mostly peaceful. The Bible says pretty much he, overall it was positive how he led. He led people toward God, not away from God. And, uh, and he would be 60 years old about the time of the reading of our story. Shortly after our story, he dies at 60 years old. All right, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Are, you still, are we still friends? Are we still good? All right, so all right, the geek stuff is over. Now, now we get to the... For some of you, the good stuff. For some of you, I just did the good stuff. All right, here we go. And if you want to hear great preaching, come back next Sunday. All right, here we go. <laughs> Pastor Mike is going to be awesome. <laughs> Second Chronicles. You know, I'm not going to leave, so you shouldn't leave right now, okay? You, wanted, you, wanted, you came here wanting to hear Pastor Mike. I get it. I wanted to hear him. <laughs> All right, here we go. Second Chronicles, are you, all right, we're, all right, 20. Verse 1, are you ready? Yeah. Let's get in, all right, so I'm going to tell you the story. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Munites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat in the southern kingdom, Judah. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea, it is already in, this army is already in Hazazan Tamar, that is in Gedi. Alarmed, alarmed. Can you give me your alarmed look? Wow, some of you are really calm when you're alarmed. <laughs> right? Give me, all right? Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord and he proclaimed a fast for all of the southern kingdom of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. You know, I told you there's going to be no more geek stuff. Well, there's going to be one more thing. I want to show you a map. I want to show you a map. Do you have a map for me? Or do we have the map? I feel like uh, Dora the Explorer. The map, the map, the map. <laughs> All right. So... The northern kingdom, the yellow there, the goldish color, that's the northern kingdom of Israel. You have the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, again, ten tribes of the north, they became the ten lost tribes of Israel because of the fact that they, they embedded in culture and they forgot about God. Then you have the two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, in the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom's capital is Jerusalem, the northern kingdom's capital is Samaria. All right. We know in this passage that the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Munites are going to come against. They have a coalition to come against. Israel has had 25 years of pretty much peace. And now you see Ammon, that's the Ammonites. You see Moab, that's Moabites. Now you see Edom. Now these are not the Edomites. The, the, the Munites were to the, to the east to the south and to the east of Edom, and so they're out of this area called Mount Seir. But what they did was they gathered together and they went on the south, southern coast of the Dead Sea and they marched up to, you see the Dead Sea, and right, you can't hardly see it there, right next to the Dead Sea is the word En Gedi. En Gedi, which is a lot of places where David hid and wrote Psalms. But anyway, that's where the, so now the army has already got to En Gedi, and you see if you go up almost straight north, a little bit to the, to the west, you see Jerusalem there. So they're there. By this time, by the time Jehoshaphat, all right, thank you very much. By the time Jehoshaphat gets word, they're already at En Gedi, and they're about to ascend up to Jerusalem. So is this a good news day or a bad news day for Jehoshaphat? This is a bad news day. A coalition is coming against them, a very vast army. This is not good at all. So let's, let's keep on looking. Verse 5, it says, when, Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, 
and no one can withstand you. This is so dire, this is so desperate that Jehoshaphat doesn't even stand in front of the assembly and asking God for anything. What he's doing is, do you hear this? Are you not you, the God of our ancestors? You are, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. It sounds like he's reminding God who he is, right? But he's not reminding God who he is. What is he doing? He's reminding himself who God is. Because sometimes when there's nothing else to do, all you can do is tell God how great, how mighty, how powerful. Because sometimes the situation is so desperate. Sometimes the situation is so dire. All you can do, you can't even ask God for anything but go, God, you are great. You are awesome. You are mighty. That's this moment for Jehoshaphat. Yeah impending death, we're just going to count on you because we're going to look to you. He's reminding himself of who God is. Verse 7, it says, Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land that we are standing on before your people Israel and give it, give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built it in a, a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity, verse 9, comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague of, or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name. We will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us, and you will save us. He's starting to talk now about the fact of reminding what God has done. God, this is what you did. You drove out, our inha you drove out the inhabitants. You set this place for us by driving out our enemies. But now just keep on going. Verse 11, see how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. God, they want to take the gift you gave us. Verse 12, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power. Say no power. We have no power, <coughs> excuse me, to face this vast army that is attacking us. We have no power. We have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but what? <clears throat> oh, you're, you're reading on that. That's cheating. <clears throat> we don't know what to do, but what? You're going to be, I'm gonna, you're going to help me saying that numerous times. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We don't know what to do, but they don't have a strategy. This is so, this is so big. This is so, this is, this is such a huge problem. There is no military strategy for this. We have nothing. We have no plans. We'd like to have some plans that would work, but we have no plans. We got everyone together and say, what should we do? We go, we don't know what to do. That's how desperate this is. We have no strategy. But Lord, our one strategy is we're going to have our eyes upon you. Amen. Amen. So verse 14 says that one of the Levites, Jehazel, he stands up and he has a word from God. Look at verse 15. This is what he said. Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what Yahweh the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. He has a word from God. He stands up. Jehoshaphat, can I share what, what God has laid upon my heart? Yes, you can share it. I'm telling you, you don't have to worry about this vast army because the battle is God's, not yours. It's not yours, but God's. It's not yours, but God's. I suggest that you take your battle and you give it to him. Don't try to fight it on your own. How many of us fight our battles on our own? Oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? How am I going to face this? What am I going to do? What are we going to do? What is our family going to do? Why don't you give it to God? I'm pr I promise you that at times, I don't, know, I don't know about this church, but our church is not a perfect church, and at times we have problems. And there are times when as the leader of our church, I go to God and I say, God, you have a problem with your church. What are you going to do about it? And I put the battle into his hands. I put, I put it into his, 
because the battle is not mine, but it is God's. And that's what, because God is saying, you don't have to fight this battle because the battle is already won. Yeah. <clears throat> they get instructions. Here are the instructions, verse 16. Are you still with me? Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz. The pass of Ziz is just to the left or to the west of what we saw as En Gedi. It's just outside of En Gedi. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. This is so. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance of Yahweh the Lord will give you Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Second time he said that for emphasis. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. So now they get their instructions. Tomorrow, here's what's going to happen. And they have a responsibility in this, and this is what their responsibility is. It's the last verse I read. You have to face your enemy. Question, do they have to fight the enemy? No. You don't have to fight the enemy, but you got to face the enemy. You can't stay balled up in the fetal position back in your room. Your responsibility is you have to face your enemy. Square your shoulders, put your shoulders back with the confidence of God. You have to, you have to show up for this. Right. Oh God, it's your battle, so therefore I don't even have to show up. I can sleep in today. No. You got to show up because if you show up, God is going to show off. The reports are not good. The odds are stacked against you. Nothing is looking great, but you still got to show up. Get out of bed, be diligent, be faithful, and do your part to cooperate with God. Because listen, them showing up and letting God fight the battle shows their cooperation and their faith and their confidence. Because they show up, God's going to fight, but by them showing up, they say we have trust and we have confidence in God. The person that wants to stay back in their room and just close their eyes has no confidence in anybody. But when we show up to face our enemy, not fight our enemy, we show that we have, we have confidence in God. And so now what does Jehoshaphat do? Let's keep on reading verse 20 and 21. So early in the morning, they left out for the desert of Tekoa, and they set out. Jehoshaphat stood. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. If we believe what God has told us, if we believe what God has promised us, we can have faith, because then you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. Verse 21, after consulting the people, so he starts to, he has a meeting. Now that they have a plan to face their enemy, what are they going to do? Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for his, the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army. Army, saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. So what does he do? So what he says, we're going to have faith in God, and then we're going to get the worship team. The worship team. And we're going to send them out first. I don't, I, do, do they look like people that want to be sent out first? Anyway. <laughs> So they, they, we're going to get the worship team, and they're going to they're going to go out first, and they're going and they're going to lead us. But they're not going to sing just any song. They're going to sing a song of thanks and praise, and the words are going to be, "Oh, give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever." Now this is going to be a song of gratitude. This is going to be a song of thanksgiving. This is going to be a song where we recognize God's goodness and his grace. Oh, give thanks. Now look what happens. Verse 22. Are you still hanging on with you with me? Yes. It says, as, as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated. 
As it happened, when in faith they began to praise God, God set ambushes for the enemy. They were singing and they were praising God for his goodness, for his grace. They had gratitude. And in the process, in the, process the enemy started to fight against each other. They started to look at the people of Seir, Mount Seir, and they, the Munites, and they thought there was something, and so they started to fight against them. And it's, it started out just with confusion to the point where the Bible says, the Ammonites and the Moabites, verse 23, rose up against the men of Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them after they finished slaughtering the men of Mount Seir. They, these are the people they're in a coalition with. They helped destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert, they looked toward the vast army. They saw only dead bodies, a dead enemy lying on the ground. No one had escaped. You don't have to fight, but you have to face your enemy. And watch what I will do. The victory at times, friends, right? We have great challenges facing us. We have things that even though we've been grateful of this Thanksgiving season, there are things in our lives that we say, this is making it really difficult. This is making it very tough. It is dire. It is desperate for some of us. There are prognoses that we have received. Maybe it was two years ago. Maybe it was five years ago. Maybe it was last week. Maybe it was a month ago. And it makes things feel very dire. And there's no there doesn't feel like there can be any strategy, but just we say, we don't know what to do, but our eyes, our eyes are on you. But it's tough at times, right? At tough at times, because when all of a sudden these things come into our lives and the difficult times come and the emotional pain is there, we don't want, we don't want to get up. We don't, want to, we don't want to rise up and go do something. We don't want to minister. We don't want to go on Sundays and Wednesdays. We don't want to serve other people. We don't want to do that. And our circumstances become the focus of our life. And the more we focus on those circumstances, the worse it gets, the heavier the burden. And it's pity party time. When am I going to get a break? When's my life going to get easier? I'm not diminishing what you're going through, friends, but what I am doing is magnifying the God that is there for you. That's what I'm doing. Because the more you focus on your circumstances, the worse you're going to feel, the less faith you're going to have, and you're not going to want to rise up to do anything. Because at that moment, we're still called to praise, right? We're still called to praise him. The victory was so great, verse 25, it says this, that, it, that they couldn't get it in one hall. It took them, they did it one day and they go, well, man, we, got, we still got some stuff to take. It took them two, three days. It took them three days to get all the spoils from this victory. And on the fourth day, the Bible says they praised again. So I have, I have a few thoughts for you in the midst of all that you're facing. Number one, you need to praise God for who he is. Just like they did, verse six, praise God for who he is. Thank him for who he is. I just started writing these things down for me that he is creator, protector, provider, he's helper, he's healer, he's shelter, he's victor, he's comforter, he's peace, he's love, he's mercy, he's grace, and he's my guide. He goes before me, he stands beside me, he goes behind me, he is my alpha, he is my omega, he is my beginning, and he is my end. He is my eternal God who never leaves me, he never forsakes me. He never leaves, he never abandons, he never forsakes, he never changes. He is always kind, he is always patient, he is always wise, he is always perfect. He is Yahweh, he is God, he is your heavenly Father. Know him, please know him so that you can praise him for who he is. Secondly, you've got to praise him for what he already has done. 
I don't know about your family and your tribe, but I know this about the Oakwood tribe. God doesn't have to do one more thing for us to have a reason to praise him for the rest of our lives. Doesn't have to do one more thing, but he continues. It's those past tense things that you can look back to. And maybe you just need to open your eyes, your spiritual eyes, because maybe there are things that you are not even aware of, because there are things, I promise you, that are, you aren't even aware of that God has been doing for you. The things, that, the things that could have happened on the way even to this gathering today, but they didn't. You know why? You don't even know about it, but God was right there. His angels were around you, protecting you and keeping you. And lastly, praise him for what he promises to do. Praise him for what he promises to do. It's easy. So Jehoshaphat and the army praised God before, right? Didn't they? They praised him before. And then they praised him after. These are two different types of thank, praise. This is two different types of praise. The after is thanksgiving, and that's easier, right? God has done all these things, so we thank him, thank him, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. The, things of the, the second praise is easier, and it's different. It's thanksgiving. The first praise is not as easy because it's the before kind of praise. It's the faith kind of praise. Someone, I love this term. I, I, I'm just going to use It's preemptive praise. It's praise before it happens because what they did was they started to thank God before they saw the answer. Before, watch out, M Mr. Monitor. <laughs> they started to thank God before. They started to thank God before. That's, that's faith. That's faith. So they got to this point where the best they could do is we don't know what to do We don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. So my question today is, where are your eyes? What are you, what are you looking at? Are you looking at your problems or are you looking at the provider? Are you looking at all the things you don't have? Or are you looking at the one you do have, the one you do have? Are you fixed? Are you fixed and focused on everything that is going wrong? Or are you fixated on he who can set it right? Are you defeated as you go into battle? Are you beat before you even enter battle? Or are you victorious entering that battle? Is it faith or is it sight, my friends? Faith or sight? I don't know what to do but my eyes are on you. And as they begin to sing and praise, the Bible says, as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes for their enemies. You tell me, you tell me, you try to tell me that if they wouldn't have praised, those ambush, ambushes would have been set because they wouldn't have been. It was their voice of praise and thanks and gratitude. They didn't know what would happen if they would begin to praise. And here's my point. You have no idea either, do you, when you begin to praise and you begin to thank and you begin in faith to thank him for what he's going to do. And this is not some silver bullet. If I just do this, then God's going to give me whatever I want. God, I'm headed to L.A. later. I want to go 100 miles an hour. I thank you in advance for no radar. No, that's not what this is about. It's a heart that is filled with just the sense of confidence and trust in God is what it is. It's not self-serving. What stands between you and your breakthrough today? Because you have the power to praise. And that power, do not underestimate the power of praise. Do not underestimate the power of gratitude. Don't underestimate the power of singing and thanking, praising God. Don't underestimate that power because it just may be your key to victory. 
Because when we start to praise God, what we start to do is we start to enthrone him. We start to declare him Lord over every area of our lives. And that's what we're going to do even right now in this moment. Is that going to be okay? And here's the deal. Here's the deal. Because I know what's going to happen. We're going to set, in just a moment, I'm going to have you stand. And we're not done yet. We're gonna, I'm going to have you stand. And when we stand, we're, I'm going to have the worship team, they're going to lead us in a song, See a Victory. It's a phenomenal song because it says the battle is the Lord's. And while we're doing this, and while they're leading us in that song, you're going to start to give him thanks. And you're going to start to give him praise. Maybe it's that healing that you're believing God for, and you haven't seen any, any results with these little peepers right here. You haven't seen any results with your eyes. But God is at work. Do you know he's at work? Do you know he's at work? Maybe it's that release. Maybe it's that addiction. Maybe it's that freedom you're desiring. Maybe it's that family situation. And it has been all too real as you've come into and out of Thanksgiving season. And it doesn't look like it's going to get any better coming into Christmas. And yet you can start to thank God for what he's going to do in that situation through you. You can start to thank God in the midst of the things, the people that are difficult to deal with at your work and at your job, in your neighborhood, in your own house, the, the marriages that you're in and the families that you have. You can start to thank God for the victory. And you thank him beforehand because that is the, that is the praise of faith. Now, now we're going to, so let's all stand, and, we're, and you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this, but I'm just saying this. Your miracle may be on the other side of you giving praise and thanks for what he's about to do. So, as we start to worship God, and I'm not leaving this spot right here. Do you guys know that? I'm not leaving this spot. I'm, le I'm just staying right here because I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm leading this charge. And we are going to, and I'm going to see it to the end. I, I'm, I told them, I told them all, I'm going to take the offering today. No, I'm not going to literally take it. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to have it done. And then I'm going to, I'm going to have the, at the end, I'm going to, I'm going to pray the prayer blessing over you at the end. That's, I get to do that. I don't want anyone else. I want to do that today. And they let me do that. So I'm going to see you right to the end. But before we do any of that, we're going to see miracles take place. People are going to be healed in just a few moments. People are, gonna, people are gonna sense and know hope that they haven't felt for a long, long time. They're gonna sense and know release and deliverance and comfort and strength and power. They're gonna sense and know things. And again, it's gonna be another other side of praise. And friends, if you, you, hold, you can hold back all you want, but it was as they began to praise, that's when the Lord said, so let's set some ambushes for the enemy, all right? Go ahead, let's just do it, let's do this. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to child. My God will never fail. My God will never
Begin to thank him for what he's going to do. Begin to thank him for the victory that he's going to give to you. Stop right now. Just keep on you praising God. Just keep on lifting your voice. Keep on praising him. Thanking him for what he's going to do. Thanking him in faith when you need to see done. Thank him for the healing. Thank him for the release. Thank him for the deliverance. Thank him for the freedom right now in Jesus' name. Thank him for the unity. Thank you, thank you God, for all you're doing right now in this place to bring victory. You take the enemy. Father, we thank you. Just, just thank him right now again. Just one last time. Thank him for all that he is going to do. What he, who he is, what he's done, and what he's going to do. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And everyone said, Amen.